brought that in for a reason. Uh, I'll just say this before I introduce uh, Graham to you. When, we, when we've done the designs, we have the opportunity to go on to either the 3D printer that we've got, or we can go on to what we call a pacer, and we can do a 3D model of what we need to be, you know, your design, basically. So, uh, <laughs> okay, well, listen, we better get started anyway, because we want to keep uh, the gentleman waiting too long. This is Graham Darby, he's the general manager of uh, Aston Martin uh, Works, and uh, he's kindly come down today to see us, and he is uh, sponsoring our project. And, uh, gentlemen, you should have your uh, questions available for you, and uh, he will answer you whatever you want to ask him, and uh, as long as it's not looking for a job or something like that. <laughs> hey, if you're good enough, come see me when you've got it. You never know. <laughs> So, gentlemen, uh, we've got two teams, uh, Graham, with us, and we've got... Uh, From our last meeting, have, yep. have the guys been given a sort of concept, or are we at that stage now? Yeah, actually, no, they have been given, the, they've, they've had a couple of weeks to been able to sort of look at the, the concept, but okay. it, you could reiterate the concept again. Well, um, it's a very, very broad spectrum for you guys, is that what's the most iconic Aston Martin ever built? Good. And what's the latest car that Aston Martin's built? Bank man. Well done. Someone's been researching. So really, you need to be looking at the fact we're in 100 years old, the most iconic car, the most modern car, and your take on what would happen if you morphed both. So a modern twist, or a modern design, using the DNA of a GD5. Now a lot of other people have done it. Mini, they've gone from the original style and they sort of stretched it and morphed it and now it's the size of a you know, Volkswagen Transport near enough for your countrymen. If you look at the Beetle, they've taken a concept that goes back to the 30s and they've kept advancing it and again and again. So we don't because we're a very small business and you know we're cutting edge nowadays so sometimes you don't want to look back at the past but because I'm responsible for the heritage and the modern side of Newport Packing a good idea for you guys is to come up with some concepts and as you're going to meet the Aston Martin's um, development engineer director in January who is um, a very very talented man um, I think it'd be a really good concept for you guys to be working so no pressure <laughs> so far away with your questions Jess they're usually gents they're just checking yeah the, yeah, the lady is not here <laughs> I won't comment <laughs> Don't be shy. Would you, you think it would be a good idea to incorporate other parts of different cars other than the GD5 and the bank? When you say other cars, if you put a Skoda badge on it, probably not. Well, I didn't know that. I'm not. I'm sorry for the sarcasm. <laughs> um, the concept's yours. You've got a very, very broad you know, plan from me, or idea from me. It's your choice. When you look at Aston Martin, what do you see in the Aston Martin that makes it a, 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 an Aston Martin? Why don't you ask yeah, the comment behind you as you've done the research? Well, what do you think? What, what do you think Aston Martin stands for? Class, safety, heritage, prestige, prestige. Our the tagline for the business is power, beauty and soul. So you have a powerful car that is beautiful and has a soul. And the soul is the fact that it's 100 years old. Okay. So look at it that way. You've got to remember is that every surface and every material is high quality. And that's what it's all about. You won't find an Aston Martin that has plastic where it should be leather or that will have, you know, plastic where it should have wood. It's all using, you know, correct quality materials. If you have an aluminium strip that goes around the window, it is solid aluminium and it's made out of one piece. It's not like a lot of other manufacturers that will slide two bits together and put a little trip over it. That's the sort of concept. But you guys don't have the time to go into that kind of detail. To me, that's the sort of, I'm not saying that's the correct shape, that's the sort of thing you want to come with. Now, you may want to say, why don't you focus on the outside? Why don't you focus on the inside? 
one of you focus on the design, or one of you focus on the mechanical engineering side of it, your choice. If you both do the same thing, it's a bit of a competition, but also it could be, well, yes, you don't want to morph into both teams, you want to be independent, because you're going to get scored on your independence, aren't you, and then you're using your common sense and your initiative. So it's your choice. You need to take your direction from each other. But to me, it's your choice. Look at the seats of the DB5, look at the seats of the Vanquish, look how much they've changed. Can you incorporate bits of both? James, now. Um, as far as ratios are concerned, the last number of years since we were talking to find out about the ratios of the cars and how they need to be perfect. And Correct. Um, is, are there any ratios that you work from in terms of the front of the windscreen should never be past this? And if I was a designer, one will be earning a lot more money than I am now, yeah. uh, and I'm not. Yeah. Um, you need to do your research. There's enough information out there. The brother named Marek Reichman, I believe so, M-A-R-I-K yeah. or E-C-K, I'm not sure. It's Reichman. He is our design director. There is sufficient on YouTube that you guys can research his design concepts. So yes, absolutely, there is um, certain angles for the A post, B post, C yeah. post, certain um, dimensions for the track and length of the car. Yeah. Um, and again, I would, I would advise you, and I'm not going to give anything away because I want to see how much initiative you guys have. Look at the dimensions of the DB5, look at the dimensions of the modern cars you choose to work from. Everything's available, you just need to look for it. <coughs> Dimensions for the Vanquish, though, not uh, I couldn't find it when I was looking at it. the actual uh, stats and figures of the Vanquish. Mm -hmm. I could find I could find it for Harappi, which is the current spin car, but yeah, I couldn't I couldn't find it for the Vanquish. And is it is it def is it on the website? Or? I wouldn't say it's on the website, but it is out there. Yeah. The other thing to do is go into your local dealer and get a brochure. Yeah. If you're really struggling, I can send you. But I really want to see you guys use your initiative. If it gets to that you can't find this, I can get you all the basic dimensions. Yeah, that's not an issue. Yeah. Let me know, and I'll, I'll, I'll email uh, Graham yeah. and we'll get some sort of. Yeah, thank you. Okay, it's not a problem. But you also need to look at things like curb loads, yeah. point loads on the wheel, and so on. Again, you mm. only have a very limited time to do this, and designing a car is huge. It takes years. Most manufacturers have a seven year turn cycle, which means that they will la launch a new car and then they'll start developing the next one and it will be ready to launch in seven years. You've got what, seven weeks? Even less. So, again, focus on, agree very early on what part of it you're going to do because you can't do the whole thing. And then be very specific on who's going to do what and your timelines and your goals. You're only as good as your weakest link, and you'll only be remembered for your last mistake. Next question. How much of this, um, what proportion would you say you need to be design, what proportion you need to be at the actual engineering? So, well, they're hand in hand. Um, again, I'm not going to specify that, and, and I'm not sufficiently knowledgeable within the the manufacturer to give you that kind of knowledge. If it's taken seven years to develop a car, you've got 70 hours. Personally, you want, if you're doing this, you want it to be something that's very visual. So look at, get the images of, of a five, look at the rake of the headlamps. And if you look at the rake of the headlamp on the five, which is that, and you look at the rake of the vanquish, which is sort of that, they're all very similar. It's a headlamp, it can't go very far, it's got to illuminate the road, it still has a form, and, but it has to have a function with it. Look at the grills, the grills are still very, very similar. So to me, it's morphing both together. Yeah. But do you want it with a high roof line like the five had, or do you want it with a lower roof line like the Vanquish had? So you're trying to produce a concept here of a modern take on a classic car. So would you want to have something with a windscreen like that? No. But would you want to have something that loses all of its 
you know, uh, all of the DNA that comes with it. No, of course you don't. So do you want to have the badge on the wing? Do you want to have a slightly different side straight? Do you want to have wire wheels? Could you get wire wheels that are 20 inches <coughs> that can do 200 miles an hour? I don't know. Could you get alloy wheels that look like them? Again, if you look at a car, what are the three things that you look at when you see a car, apart from the pretty woman in the passenger seat? The bonnet wheel. I, I know what I look at, is I'm asking you guys. Everyone's shape. From, from, a, from an owner or a customer's perspective, the, the three things you check are windscreen, number plate, wheels. Yeah. So you look at it and think, is it new? Is it private plate? You look through the windscreen, is it clean? You look at the wheels and think, they're nice. So that from, from my perspective, when I'm working with my customers, if I give a customer a car back, he's got clean wheels, clean windscreen, clean number plates, a lot of the other things that may not be right, they'll ignore. So that's one thing to look at. Another thing you can also look at is when a car goes past. If a Ferrari goes past, what do you guys think? Well, <coughs> if an Aston Martin goes past, what do you think? Same. Really? Yeah. Well, no, not <laughs> quite the same. It's not quite as sport as in it's more of a gentleman's car. And again, that's my point. If you have a bright red Ferrari that goes down the road sounding like a hair dryer, mm -hmm. everybody goes, wow, flash kid. Somebody drives down the road in Aston Martin makes just as much noise, but it's a different time. They think, that's a cool car. Mm. That's what you've got to remember as well. Are there any aspects of either the DD5 or the Vanquish that you would personally regret being there? That you think personally the DD5, yes, I'd, I'd, I'd love the car, that the fact that it had a, a five-speed gearbox, not a four-speed. I like the fact that you don't roast when you're sitting in traffic, but we made all those changes when we restored them. Um, the new Vanquish, yeah, I wish my iPhone 5 was working it. <laughs> I'm waiting for the software up there. Um, no, the, each car has its good and its bad points, and it's all down to the uh, relative owner. Um, the DB5, personally, for somebody my height, and you're quite tall as well, anybody over six foot really struggles. Whereas in the Vanquish, because the floor pan's lower and the headlining is slightly higher, anybody that's over six foot can fit. When you drive one of the older cars, you like that. So again, when I say to you about roof line, where the seat position is and so on, think about the fact is that we're all getting bigger as the generations go on, as we discussed earlier. So where's the biggest emerging market for Aston Martin at the moment? Asia. Specifically? Japan. Yeah. What body size do you think a rich Chinese man is? He's short, he's fat, and he doesn't move very well. And this is not me being rude, this is statistically. Yeah. What doesn't fit in a sports car? <laughs> fat people. Hmm? Quite large. We can't discriminate against size, but what we have to do is accommodate the design to ensure that it can be used by all sizes, shapes. Yes. So the opening of the door. When you open the door, is the door going to open that way? Is it going to open slightly upwards? And again, this would be your research for Aston Martin, because Aston Martin doors do not open like that. I'll tell you no more when you need to research them. But you need to think about when you open the door, what's the height of the sill? Where's the seat base? Is it a two plus two or is it a two plus zero? So are you going to have it so that people with no legs or young babies can fit in the back? Or is it going to be an out and out sports car? Lots and lots of options here. <coughs> I don't want to confuse you too much, but you know, you're bouncing like this, so you I'll answer your questions all day long. Who's next? Yes, we, yes. Um, there, there's a standard set of colours, um, which again you can find on the website, and if you go into the vehicle configurator, it will show you the standard colours. However, you can have it any colour. Okay. Oh, right. well, you saw that when you came right, down yeah. with the cars with the pink and yellow interiors. Yeah, that's 
how do you get new colors for new cars? For example, like Volcano Red, when you ran it, that was useful, but how do you design, how do you get that color? Because you haven't had that many other models previously. Well, that's the reason why. Because people are requesting that they have something new. Um, if you've got a DBS, or you've got a DB9, or you've got a V8, um, when you get a new model, you don't want it all to be the same car. Some people do, don't get me wrong. We've got collectors that have uh, their cars, every car in the same colour. And they've got dozens and dozens of Aston Martins and they've got them in a the garage and it's just like a sea of yellow or a sea of red. Um, but you do market research, you speak to the customers, you get feedback. Um, and some of it also is the fact is that when you do a, a CAD image and you pull it up on the screen, you think, oh, that's cool, I like that one. But you can have any colour you want if you want to pay for it. We've just done one for a guy in Australia and it's a four-stage pearl. It's about £16,000 worth of paint. And it is a four different colours, depending on the angle you look at the car and the light that's on the car. So that looks pretty cool, but God help if it gets a stone chip. <laughs> you know, so you know, think about it. It's £1,200 a litre for the paint. <laughs> so, you know, yeah. Uh, you can have any colour you want. Absolutely any colour. What was the yellow chains? Uh, Aston Martin colour? Me personally, yeah. uh, what's Aston Martin racing green? That's my personal view, but in this market you wouldn't buy a green car because allegedly they're unlucky and they don't resell. No. So my Aston Martin I've just ordered, I'm afraid I've just gone for Storm Red. No, Storm Black, which is a red pearl, not a black. Do you find culturally that people don't have certain colours yeah. as well? The UK and European market are very grey, black, yeah. and silver, blue, which I personally find boring. If you're driving a sports car, it should be subtle, but it should be something that people look at and say, mm, I like that. It is to get the, the, the Asian kind of population, therefore, a car that is a little more showy up in. Yes, absolutely, yeah. that's part of their culture. So, like the um, uh, people from Dubai, they go for. Have you seen anybody of you guys Google the Dubai Motor Show? Yes, that's the Martin stand. Did you see some of the colours and the schemes are on that? So, you've got a Madagascar orange, a bright, bright orange. Um, we've also done uh, a Madagascar orange with a black interior. We've done a black with a Madagascar orange interior. We've also done pearl white with a blue stripe. Um, I've just been asked today to paint a new Vanquish with cobalt blue, which is a beautiful, beautiful metallic blue, um, with a very dark blue as well, but they only want the blue and the centenary stripe down the middle. So you're gonna have dark blue car with a stripe down it. Um, a lot of the cars in, in um, China, uh, Hong Kong, Macau, those sort of areas, all, all the same country effectively. They like two tone. Um, so we've done a lot of concept for people with repeats with having sort of a black bottom, red top, red top, black bottom, even things with chrome roofs, things like that. So yeah, absolutely, it, it's it's culturally it is very different. The Americans like yellows, reds, whites. Um, yeah, base colours, yeah. Can you get can you choose any colour for the interior as well? So you get like a stripe going into the car? If you want it to, no. yeah. Um, we've got, um, um, this guy saw it, we had some lady who loved her dog a lot, so we embroidered her dog on the seat. Um, I offered that, obviously as the dog got bigger, she bought the car back every two years, I'd do a bigger one. Um, I thought that was good business, because I could make money out of it by doing it. Um, no, we, we, we have done every single possible type of interior colour that you could ever think of. So don't you think it goes against the, um, the actual Image of, uh, no, I, I don't think so. I think Aston Martin is about expressing your individuality. So if you want to have a pink car with a yellow interior or a yellow car with a red interior, it's your choice. You probably won't ever sell it again. Yeah. But it's about personalising the car. And the risk is to be too much like Ferrari, very Correct. flashy. Mm -hmm. and Correct. Where do you yeah. draw a line? Yeah. We don't. We don't. The most important thing. We did refuse to, pa to paint uh, um, in the nineties. We did refuse to paint the car bright pink. Um, and so the owner took it away and got it painted bright pink and bought it back. Mm. But nowadays, it's... But the badge, the badge is on it. <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, so absolutely. So, so <laughs> if you don't draw a line, how come you manage to stay as subtle as you have been? Because most work? owners respect it. Yeah. I think even if, if, you, if, if you went with any paint, you still know it's an Aston Martin. Yeah. Regardless, even if you didn't have the badge on, you should still think that that looks like an Aston Martin. Yeah. And I think that's before we get too drawn out here. That's what you need to remember. There is a form and a function for Aston Martins. 
throughout the years. And that's the thing you need to remember. It needs to, without the badges, look like an Aston Martin. So that side straight, grill, headlamps, roof line, rear end, the lot. Take into account the rear ends now, we, we're drawing a lot of the 177 concepts for um, rear lights, um, the shape of the rear wings, um, the um, new bank, which is the only production car which actually has a rear spoiler which is within the construction of the tailgate. So it's, it's also cutting edge. So would you do something that you bolt a spoiler on? Nah. Would you want it to be like a Mercedes or a Ferrari when you get to 50 miles an hour it pops up? It's, and as you rightly say, it's about subtlety. Aston Martin don't do wild cars. They never will. So what was the reasoning behind the 177? It's still a subtle car. Mm. What was the reason behind it? Because we could. But out of all your history, you haven't never been like, or something that powerful, it's or, or yeah, that, that kind of well, it actually that you, price range. And all that kind price of range, thing. yes, I agree with you totally. And, 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 and yeah, it's smooth. If you look at a DB4 GT, okay, so a DB4 GT, which is 60s, 50s, 60s, 60s, that car started with a six cylinder engine, um, 3.7 litres. When you had the DB4 GT, it was a 4.3 twin spark plug, twin distributor, and you went from a four speed to a five speed gearbox, you changed the suspension layout, you changed the axle. So you went from a car that could do 120 miles an hour to a car that did 150 miles an hour. 177 went from a car that could do 190 miles an hour, being a production car, to a car that could do 205. So actually, if you look at how we progressed throughout the year, if you look at the Vantage, original Vantage in the late 80s and 90s, standard car was a 4 litre, a 4.2 litre V8. Yeah, sorry, 5 litre V8. What, what was the most wild car they did? If you know your history, and I'm not picking on you here at all, it's just that you obviously know some of it. You have the supercharged Vantage. Okay, so that was a six litre V8 twin supercharged, 600 horsepower manual car. But that's just a simple step up. But it's not a simple step up. Yeah, you are taking 100 horsepower, twin superchargers, increased gearbox, increased axle, wider track, different body panels, different interior, different seats. A 177, the only different construction method on it was we went away from an extruded aluminium bonded chassis to a carbon fibre chassis, and that was because of weight because a 7.3 litre V8 and all the transmission gear and suspension that with it weighs more than the standard car. Well, that was the most powerful and actually aspirated engine of any production car so far. Put in the Aston Martin. Doesn't that kind of break the kind of subtlety? Maybe, maybe. It was a, a car that is, was produced to show what we're capable of doing. So you could go out by a Veyron, couldn't you? And where's your switch gear from? Volkswagen for Sat. Where's your gearbox from? An Audi S8. Where's the engine from? On a 177. Handmade. Where's your engine well, from an Audi? It's the same as the engine in your Golf or your Skoda. Where's your engine in your Mini? It's the same as in your 3 Series or your 1 Series. The engine in your Lamborghini is the same as your engine in an R8. So it's just kind of like a form of statement to rather than Absolutely, it's a statement. That's why we charge 1.2 million pounds plus tax on it. And we sold the last one at my uh, Newport Packing three weeks ago for 1.4 million pounds plus tax, because it was the last one there. So yes, it was a statement. It was a statement of engineering. It was a statement of style. It's also a statement of where we were going to go with design concept. So if you think about a lot of the design concepts that are on there are now incorporated into Vanquish and CC100. So yes, a bit different, but if you look, we have a history of pushing engineering that nobody else did. Nobody else had, in the, uh, in the early 90s, had a V8 engine with twin superchargers producing 600 brake horsepower. Nobody. Lots of people made specials or one-offs and sent them away to engineering firms. Nobody had them as a standard car. If you look at the DB3S, which is 1953, that was a twin spark plug, twin distributor, six-cylinder engine that won them off. So it's morphing throughout the ages. But good discussion. Who's next? Some of you are very quiet. <laughs> it's very unusual. Yeah, it's <laughs> <pretty> surprising. <laughs> um, we were looking at 
Cellini cars. And, yes. Uh, one of the decisions we weren't quite certain on was four doors or two. No choice. We did both. Pure. Mm. Sure. <coughs> well, I've just ordered a Vanquish Valanti, so um, no. I also have four dependents. I won't say children, but they might. They're dependents now. So, would I like a four door? I drive a four door Jaguar at the moment until I get my Aston Martin in. The, the, the Rapide's a great car. I've done thousands of miles and have travelled long distances with adults in the back. It's a great car. Its form and function is why it's been built. Is it true Aston Martin DNA? My view, no. My personal view, no. Aston Martin is two door sports cars. Lagonda is four door cylinder cars. What were your views on the Insignia? I can't comment on that, I'm afraid. It was a great concept. It was needed for the EU legislation that it applied to. It's now out of production. It's part of our history that's now passed. So we'll move on. I actually make more profit out of selling signals now than I do out of a lot of other used cars because they're rare. So actually, I think for something that we made 700 of them, um, I actually think it's going to go quite well in the next five, 10 years because as soon as they stop production, everybody wants one. Great news. Got me great marketing, but um, yeah, we're making a lot of profit out of them now because people are buying them. It's fantastic. But as a car, it's a city car. That's what it was all about. Drive very well, though. Got that. Would you recommend to make a clay model of our design? You haven't got time. Not got time. That's the sort of thing you need to do, or 3D printing. Clay model could take 20 to 30 hours of your entire project time. If you wanted to take it further in your own time after the event, yes, absolutely, you'd need to make a 180 or something along those lines. If it's good enough, you never know, I might send it to Marek. Make sure you get a payment for it. Okay. Yes. Yes, but I can't tell you about it, <laughs> and I wouldn't. Yes, the, the, the new models in, in, in development now, yes, absolutely. Yeah. And if anyone's done the research, who is the major OEM that we've had a tie-in, 5% tie-in in the last four months for technology? God, you haven't researched for anyone, have you? No? AMG. AMG now have a 5% stake in Aston Martin because it's a technical partner. So, see it in two, three years' time, I think you might find that the V8 are built in the different parts of Germany to where they are now. And these guys. Maybe that's one thing you need to consider. <coughs> Anything else? Bold course speed. Bold course speed. If, if, if um, what, what, what do you think uh, suits Aston Martin more? If you were making, you tell me. Model. Well, I'm, I'm not sure, you because my DNA of Aston Martin, I've just explained to you. Aston Martin, my view, is a two-door sports car. Sports car in its nature, or Grand Tourer. Yeah, but if, if, if we were moulding the DB5, that's not a four. But I'm not saying that, am I? I'm telling you to do a modern twist. The DB5 was a cutting edge sports car when it was launched. Why do you think James Bond was driving the thing? What was the other car that was in the first film in Goldfinger? What did he race down the mountains against? The white. What a mistake. Convertible. So no, it's all about sports car. If you turn around and said, actually I'm not going to go Aston Martin, but I'm going to do the Gonda route then that's my, my view is Aston Martin's two-door sports cars always has been. Yeah? The Gonda is four-door cylinder cars. But that's my personal view. Um, you know the Zagato? Which yes. Uh, uh, which one? Uh, the GT. Um, the old four? Older version. Uh, V8? DB7? Four. four. Seven? four. Uh, <laughs> um, and how come there were only 16 made of them? Were they, was it just because it was Pure so and uh, we were in the middle of a recession at the time and nobody wanted to buy them. Was it that 
it was more okay. It was more expensive. Simple as. Yeah. No different. It, it was pure economics. I remember Aston Martins in those days were although a very expensive car were another of sports cars and very, very low volume. Some years we made thirty cars. <coughs> Mate, that's a day. So, uh, the reason they made so few is because they couldn't sell them. Yeah. And the reason they made sanctioned twos was because they had original chassis and chassis numbers left over, and then there was a market for it. Because the rest of the Zagatos they made on the V8 and the V7. Yeah. How many did they make? 99. Just a small production. Mm -hmm. And the reason they do that is because <coughs> keeps the fat. What do you think is going to be the next step for Aston Martin in terms of its development? Not like the tyre with AMG for a start. Um, we, we are a very small motor manufacturer in a very, very large pod. So if you think about it, we have 1,200 employees globally. Um, Volkswagen Group use that amount of people to test the on-off switch on the stereo. Yeah, so that's that's the reality. Um, I'd be spec I, I can only speculate where we'll be in five years' time. Um, but I, I would say the writings on the wall, if AMG had tied up with us, then there's a very good chance we will be um, uh, associated closer with a, a large OEM. Uh, and if it's AMG, who are owned by Daimler, we can imagine it's going to be Daimler or Mercedes Benz. What are your views on working with a company like Lotus and AMG? Um, the world's got a, you can't stand still. If you stand still, you're dead and you're going backwards. So you have to move forward. If we don't have a fighting chance in a competitive market because we don't have a big overall owning company like Fiat for Ferrari or Volkswagen Group for um, Lamborghini and, and Maserati or, or um, Bentley or BMW and Rolls Royce, you're very limited on what you can do. How much do you think it is to design, test, build and implement a new engine? How much do you think in euros an engine? about 85 million pounds. <laughs> a bit much, but yeah. probably the whole car is about. <coughs> so, if you think about how much profit you make in selling one car, how much do you think you, on average you would make on selling an Aston Martin globally? How much do you think the average profit is per car? Money-wise, how much do you think? Uh, Five grand, 10 grand, 20 grand, 50 grand? You bet right there. You make 3,900 cars a year. Who's the mathematical genius in here? Once again, we'll <laughs> work it out from there. So if you make 3,900 cars a year and you make 15 to 20,000 pounds profit per car, how many years before you've got enough money to develop a new engine? Just the engine. Forget the fact that you've got the seats, the bodywork, the transmission, the brakes, the suspension, the steering. See what I mean? So that's why you go to the company like Cosworth. Correct. Absolutely. So, as I said, in industry, if you stand still, you're going backwards. You have got to continue to strike forwards, whether that's on styling, whether that's on power. If you think about it, we went from um, the DBS engine, which is 6 litre V12, but not with variable timing. You look at the engine of the new Vanquish now, it's still a 6 litre V12, but it's got variable timing, it's got different um, valve gear, it's got different angles of uh, valve seats and so on, which means it's a more economical engine, which means it helps you with legislation for EU for emissions, but it's a more powerful engine because you can vary the valve timing. That took five years. So, where do you think we'll be in five years? Well, I hope with a few billion invested into us, if I'm honest. Do you ever get problems with, because um, obviously designing cars will take take between five to ten years, with technology, yeah. not, well, you not catching up with technology at the end, realising on? No, luckily we're quite brave. Right. We actually go with cutting edge technology and always have. Yeah. We were the first company to ever use extruded, bonded and riveted aluminium uh, for our chassis. We were the first people to have uh, carbon fibre panels, which is on the new Vanquish from 2001. We were the first company to have a fully clad carbon fibre car when it comes to Vanquish now. The switch gear on the new Vanquish is actually like your iPhone, so it's touching. 
You know, in most cars, you press a button, don't you, like that, and you can actually scroll the actual glass screens. So that, again, is cutting edge. Yeah. Aston Martin have always been cutting edge. What the, we have is the delay between when we have first launched the car to when we can get another one out. Because if you think about it, DB9, V8 are over 10 years old now. They're in different variables of it. They've advanced massively when it comes to the, the, the technology within them, but they're still basic DNA of what they were when they were first produced in 2003. Yeah. Is this actually helping your project, or are you just shooting in general about mm -hmm. Aston Martin? Which is great. I don't mind. I talk all night about it. It's, it's my passion. So. Just talking about, um, as you know, we've got uh, there are two groups here, and we are still in the early days of. Sure. Uh, they are in the early days of designing, and I've got no idea how much they achieve so far. I will find out soon. <laughs> however, however uh, we know we uh, you know we've got access to a wind tunnel. Would yes. you be interested uh, if one of the group or both of them decide to do some uh, research yeah. about their design? And well, the interesting thing would be to data. get the drag coefficient of what the DB5 was and the drag coefficient of what the bank was and do something in between. So you need to have something that's still got the same or better coefficient but looks different. So you've got to also remember is that most cars are designed by very, very uh, advanced computers. The actual human element is not little now. Um, if you actually strip away sort of the curves of the bonnets and the headlamps and so on, most cars look pretty similar nowadays. If you can only go through air so quickly and so smoothly until we start looking like Formula One, which is not going to happen because there's one old grain sweeping down straight up the legs car, which is a problem. I am joking. Well, it was in the papers, uh, they need more time to cross the roads, or I do. And uh, so they're, they're, they're going to make the lights uh, stay off a little bit longer. Sounds good for me. Yeah. Yep. So we all get a little bit slow as we get older. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, no, that's, that's the concept yeah. for sure. Yeah. For sure. You are limited on time, gentlemen. Yeah. You have 70 yeah. hours. That is not a lot. That's not even two working weeks. Can I reiterate something as well? And this is when you're working as a team, and because taking the, the, the project out of the equation, um, you have to manage a team here. Where you, if you were in, a, if you were working for Aston Martin, they, they don't have the sort of, uh, oh, I haven't bought it with me, I haven't done this or I anything forgot. like that. I forgot. You, you won't get a work in the real world. You will not get away with that. Okay, your job will be on the line, uh, basically. That's not a pressure thing. What I'm saying is, if you're working with a good team, and you set, you send uh, somebody off to go and say to do a CAD, then you expect them to get the CAD done, and you they are relying on you to do your job properly, as you are relying on you know like Hadidi to do it and so on and so forth. So working as a team, you have to manage the Norman and Stormin uh, side of it. And that means falling out with each other and then getting back together again and stuff. Quickly. Quickly, yeah, because you've got time deadline on it and you have to get together and say, look, I'm sorry, blah, 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 let's get on with this. Because this is one thing that press does with us, which is different, right, with the EPQs that we currently have, is that you're working as an individual, but as a working as a team, it's harder. It, it can be easier if you all work together, but it can be harder if uh, people go off track because if you don't fulfill the, the team's uh, criteria, then you're letting the team down, basically. You're only as good as the weakest. Absolutely. Team. So if I was you and I, we all have worked on projects with Tom, you need to very clearly set out the stages of the development, who's doing what and when. If you all stand in a huddle talking about it, you'll yeah. get nowhere. Mm -hmm. So you need to say, Right, you're going to go and do X, you're going to go and do Y, you're going to go and do A, you're going to go and do B, and you go off and do your set objectives in the agreed timeline. Yeah. And if you can't, don't get worried or scared. Say, I'm struggling, help. That's so important. And if you get it wrong, yeah. say, got that wrong, yeah. and then do it again. Yeah. Don't hide it under the carpet, come out of it, just say, I messed up. And you fix it very, very quickly by doing that. What I'd like to see at the end of this is that, um, as we all know, and Graham is more than aware, he's not going to expect you know, the gold-plated version because you've got 70 hours. What he will expect is that you've done research. You have, you, yeah. Something along those yeah. lines, yeah. a finished article, will be absolutely perfect. Now, 
what you need to show behind me, sorry to cut across oh, you, no is the workings that got you there. Mm. So the initial meetings, even if you put a sheet of paper on a board and you just have a brainstorm, yeah, write it down, keep it, photograph it, put that information into the file because you need to understand the process mm. that gets you to something like that. Mm. And if you want to make something flashy at the end, back form that. Mm. And, and that's the bottom line of it really. You can't just sit there and say, because we like the look of it, you, you have to have um, you know all your data behind it to back it up. That's the reason why you went that way. Um, because otherwise it's just a drawing exercise. Uh, and that's not what we want. We want a little bit more to it in the wind tunnel. If we can get the, these done, you know, we get them in the wind tunnel and you've got a little bit more data there to support your uh, design as well. So that way. We're always here. Email if you have any other questions for Graham or anything like that. Come through uh, either Mr. Vincent or myself. We will, um, if Graham is available, that he will answer the, the questions if he can. Do the best he can. Yeah. I'm out of country for the second week and possibly the third week of December. But being a sad person, I'm still having my phone, so I can't answer the most of So there you go. It's, it's, it's I'm going to send you yeah. the detailed specifications. No, I can't get to you. It, it shouldn't. It shouldn't get to that point. Hopefully not. But it'd be interesting to see what they actually come up with. Really. And this is the beauty of it. You know, we, you, you said, "Well, we'll Aston Martin B." You know, in five years' time, it could be part of your design. <laughs> something. You know, you think, "Oh, yeah, that's interesting." You know, Who knows? Like, you might be employed yeah. as a designer in five years' time. Yeah. The one thing I will ask you to do, Graham, though, is just reiterate what you said to uh, Mr. Vincent and myself with regard to not making sure that Aston Martin is not, um, you know, it is a concept car. Yes. Yeah. Conceptually, um, it is exactly what this is about. What you can't be doing is putting wings all over it, and you can't be putting the words Aston Martin all over it. And I tell you that is because of uh, IPR. Do you know what IPR is? Intellectual property rights. You don't have the right to use the name or the wings unless my lawyers say you can. So, and this is my whole point about what it looks like. If you see a DB5, even without the badges, you know it's a DB5. If you see any Aston Martin, even without the badges, you know it's an Aston Martin. So please, if you're with the project, I've got no problem with Aston Martin Press Project, but on the final result, you cannot put wings on, and you cannot put the name Aston Martin on. If the concept team that I show it to at Gaiden take it on board and like it, and maybe it goes further, I don't know, then we'll have a different conversation. That's all I ask for. The IPR issues. Um, it's not worth putting us in a position where I have to go and have a chat with our lawyers because it's not overly pleasant if I'm honest. Right? That's my only request. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. Any other questions? I'm sitting there working a bit quiet, waiting for the Xbox or Coronation Street. It's that time of night, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Any more questions, gentlemen? Don't feel pressured at all. Seriously, yeah. you'll go away and in 20 minutes on you'll think, ah, oh, I didn't ask this. Write it down. Yeah. And, and do me a favour. If you come up with 20 different questions, can they sort of like send me 20 in one go, not one every half an hour? <laughs> yeah. So, you know, if you get to the end of a certain stage and there's questions you want to ask, compile a set of questions, not... I, I think we'll filter. We'll if that's all right. Yeah, no, yeah. we'll do it okay. Uh, yeah. That would be very helpful. Yeah. Thank you. Sorry. All right, gentlemen. Good luck. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thanks for having us. Maybe you should sort out the. Uh, the uh, can I have your. Uh, Brainstorming. Your